Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Frank Bird, and I'm the publisher of Inside Business Magazine, and I'm also a proud member of the City Club. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, Dean and w Day, w, John W. Barry, easy for me to say, uh, Senior Chair in Business at the Ohio State Fisher College of Business, Anil K. McKeeja. Round of applause would be appropriate, that's fine. <laughs> you know, in this country, especially now, in the midst of the busy political season, we seem to talk a lot about two types of businesses, large multinational corporations and small businesses. To listen to the public, the public conversation is to be told that there's nothing in between. And of course, that is just not true. We're here today to discuss the middle market, companies with revenues between $10 million and $1 billion. This is not a small number of companies. We're talking about nearly 200,000 companies that account for one-third of the total private employment. If you looked at the individual market segment, the U.S. middle market would be the world's fifth largest global economy just behind Japan and ahead of Germany. Our speaker today is, rec is a recognized expert in the field of finance, particularly capital structure, corporate governance, and valuation and has more than 20 years of experience in academic leadership roles. Anil Makija was appointed to the Dean of the Ohio State University Fisher School of Business in October of 2014. Prior to that appointment, Mr. Makija served as a Senior Associate Dean as a member of the faculty of the Business College. He played a key role in the development of the GE Capital Funded National Center for the Middle Market serving as the center's economic director. He received a bachelor's degree from the Indian Institute of Technology, a master's degree from Tulane, and a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club, please welcome the Dean of the Ohio State University Fisher College of Business, Dr. Anil Bakija. Thank you, Frank, and uh, thank you to the City Club of uh, Cleveland uh, for this uh, extraordinary special opportunity uh, to speak to you about the middle market uh, and perhaps in the process about the middle market center, uh, which is uh, actually called the National Center for the Middle Market at the Fisher College of Business at The Ohio State University in Columbus. <clears throat> Uh, I think uh, in some ways to talk about the middle market, I might take you on a small journey uh, with regard to the national center of the middle market. You see, go back to 2011, not so far back really. GE Capital is looking for a partner to l study uh, middle market firms. Why? because uh, middle markets were the main part of their um, GE capital portfolio, uh, and uh, so they wanted to understand uh, uh, their business uh, in greater depth. And uh, it so transpired that though GE capital had spoken with a number of institutions across the country, uh, that we landed up partnering with them. And I think part of the reason we landed up partnering with them is that our visions with regard to what should be done for the middle market came together. How so? Uh, we proposed, and, uh, and they liked it, uh, and we worked together on this subsequently, to study middle markets not only from a research perspective, not only from a corporate uh, outreach perspective, but also from a student and curriculum perspective. So a kind of a more comprehensive view of the middle market, looking not only at just kind of studying it in research. And in fact, when I later, or hopefully will have a few minutes, um, uh, since you're more interested in listening about the middle market perhaps than the cent national center about it, I might talk about what we do in each of these three buckets. And the reason for doing so would be that it produces some resources that you perhaps might find useful. So in 2011, 
there was no real definition of what a middle market is. And frankly, to this day, there is nothing written in stone about what the middle market should be. But the National Center, the middle market, our center, did propose a definition. And that's the definition that uh, Frank just mentioned. Uh, firms with revenue from 10 million to 1 billion. Clearly, that's very large territory. And we recognize that from day one. So in fact, what we have done is in everything that we do, uh, we split the data into uh, three segments going from 10 million to 50 million, from 50 million to 100 million, and from 100 million to a billion. We obviously had a debate as to you know where small-like behaviors stop and on the large side where large-like behaviors take on. And so in going, doing these three segments, as well as the aggregated middle market, uh, we are able to provide, I hope, insights about what is happening in this market. And I think it was very important that this segment get some, its, some of its deserved attention. And again, Frank pointed out this too, uh, that you know, the, the discourse in the country tends to be about small firms and about large firms. And I'll be the first to say that they are important parts of our economy and they fully deserve the attention they get. But in addition, I think there is a yet another segment uh, which is not getting the attention it deserves. And as subsequently we be began to study the data, uh, we began to understand why that might be happening and what role we could play in illuminating this segment. So first of all, in the US economy, just to get a sense of what the segments look like, uh, 10 million and less, I'm going to call them small firms. There are 6 million such firms in the US economy, roughly. With revenue more than a billion, there are only about 2,200 firms. Now, of course, some of those 2,200 firms are uh, massive firms. I mean, you know, GE Capital, uh, you know, Google, and you know, they, I mean, they can run into hundreds of billions of dollars of revenue. Okay, so, but sitting in the middle uh, is the 200,000 that uh, Frank alluded to. But it might be interesting to also ask yourself, what proportion of all firms does this these 200,000 make? And now that I've told you the numbers on either end, you know, we're talking roughly about. 3% of all firms, okay? So why bother about this 3% of all firms? And the reason is that we discovered that this 3% of the firms accounts for roughly one third of all private sector jobs in this country. And about one third of non-government GDP. So here's this very important segment of the economy that wasn't getting a lot of attention, and I'll again come back to why not, okay? Uh, in, in a national scheme, an international scheme, uh, you know, very large as a, you know, uh, segment by itself, you know, USA, China, India, Japan, the US middle market, then comes Germany, okay? so so and yet not getting the attention it deserves. Why? Because small firms deservedly get attention from the Small Business Administration. There's formal advocacy at that end. And large firms, as you know, have deep pockets, and they're can they in the public eye, so they get the necessary attention as well. It turns out that this middle segment, these 200,000 firms, are largely private. So that, of course, has consequences. Either they're family-owned or they're private equity-owned. But that means SBA is not collecting data about them, and at the same time, uh, you know, they don't, they don't give data like large firms to the SEC. So this is the kind of a case where we have this large, important segment of the economy in terms of employment, in terms of GDP, uh, and I'll refer to other things soon, uh, but at the same time, not getting any you know, deserved attention. 
So that became our mission in life as a center, uh, with GE Capital taking an active role in the center to kind of understand what is going on in this segment. Uh, and one of the things I'll do is I will tell you where this segment is today relative to some of the other segments so you can sort of get a sense of where it is going in the economy. But before we get to that, uh, there may be a, a very natural tendency to say, well, we know things about small firms. The SBA helps us. We know a lot about large firms. Uh, so maybe we're just talking about the average of the two, okay? That what sits in the middle is kind of like small firms or like large firms. In some ways, you would be right, but it turns out that middle market firms are characteristically their own animal, okay? Uh, shall I say, uh, if I were to give an analogy, you do not take a matured old person and a kid and say that the needs and desires and the functionality of an adult is just the average of the two, okay? It, it, that doesn't work, right? Now let me give you some data about middle market firms. You'd come to the same conclusion that middle market firms aren't just some simple average of the two. So let's think about uh, uh, the Great Recession that we all suffered through 2007 to 2010. Officially, yes, 20, 2008 to 2009, uh, if you look at official count of a recession. But in that general period, during this period, you know, there was a lot of body shocks to, to the economy, and large firms laid off by you know, varying estimates 3.5 to 3.7 million people. You know, unemployment rose tremendously. We talk about that 10 plus percent unemployment and we watch it where it's come today and so on and so forth. So this is what large firms were doing. Guess what middle market firms did during this period? While large firms were laying off 3.5 plus million people, middle market firms added employees to the tune, by our estimates, of about 2.2 million jobs. So why are they behaving so differently? I mean, you know, uh, they're not like small firms, and I'll make a comparison with small firms in a moment. Well, the reason they may be behaving somewhat differently from large firms could well be that as private firms, their horizons are kind of different. Large firms, understandably, big contributors to the economy deserve the attention they get. Uh, I think for a holistic economy, you want thriving all segments. But large firms, being publicly traded, get often fixated with the next quarterly earnings report. So there's a rush to make corrections, whereas the middle market firms that typically may have had a harder time getting that best talent which was you know, uh, taken up by the large firms, suddenly is available now to the, small f to the middle market firms. And perhaps that's what was you know, longer horizon, uh, reputational issues with families, et cetera, et cetera. So you can imagine that their behaviors with respect to ACA, Obamacare, might also be kind of different. And could it also be the case that regulation hits middle market firms differentially differently than for small firms or large firms? There are going to be exemptions for small firms. Large firms are able to negotiate economies of scale to get uh, you know, good arrangements. Middle market firms may be carrying an inordinate burden of regulation, perhaps. And these middle market firms aren't necessarily similar to small firms either. The average longevity that we found for middle market firms is dramatically different from the longevity, mortality of uh, small firms. Small firms arguably live on average seven to eight years. You know, the little restaurant on the corner turn, tends to turn over and so forth, right? Again, they play an important role in the economy and all segments are important. 
But might I add that that seven, eight years of kind of mortality is very different from the 31 years average that we found for the data that we had studied for middle market firms. It's completely different sets of expectations and behaviors. So perhaps uh, uh, we, we recognize that middle market firms are important. Uh, they are an understudied segment. They deserve the attention they, they deserve uh, because of their role in the economy, the importance that they play, and the fact that they can't be understood as simple averages. But we might still argue that maybe sitting here in Ohio and Cleveland, uh, you, you know, that's not a main issue for us uh, because maybe, you know, these are firms that are sitting on the coasts and other places and so forth. By the way, many of them are well-known name brands. Uh, Vitamix here, R.G. Berry, uh, Krispy Kreme, I mean, you know, uh, these are all middle market firms, you know. Uh, so, so what about us? I mean, Ohio, should we worry about middle market firms? Do they play an important role? Well, here's some data about uh, middle market firms in Ohio, and then I'll say a few about Cleveland, too. And incidentally, uh, in a moment, I'll also turn to how we have all this kind of data. Uh, and, and perhaps an invitation for you to visit our website where there is a lot more data than I will be able to convey for now. Only 1% of Ohio firms are middle market firms. 1%. But 37% of employees in the state are hired by middle market firms. 20% of all business revenue can be attributed to those 1% firms. Now, if you start to think about their role in the economy of what, you know, they, by the way, they're also pillars of the community because many of these are family owned where people have a personal attachment to the neighborhood, to the city, to the, you know, community, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so their role in a social sense may even be larger than the pure economic role, which is outsized. Cleveland. By our estimation, there are about 1,200 middle market firms in Cleveland. That's about 1% of firms by our estimation. That explains about 32% of employees and about 23% of revenue. So the story is not just national, it's not just Ohio, it's with you right here, okay? Now, where is the middle market? So now that we've laid out some reasons why we should pay attention to this segment, what is this segment doing and so forth? So let me back up. As I said, our center does activities in three buckets. Uh, it does research on the middle market, it does outreach activities, uh, and it does student and curriculum related activities. So a quick run through these activities so that I can then turn to uh, where is the middle market today as we find through our different activities. In terms of research, the center does three kinds of research. First, what I would call sort of fundamental academic research. Uh, these are projects that typically take a long time uh, because they deal with kind of fundamental issues. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, a study can take a year plus uh, to do. And uh, so the center has undertaken these. And by the way, uh, as you might expect, uh, you know, we've uh, persuaded a uh, you know, fair proportion of our Fisher faculty to do projects in this so we can build some local expertise. And we are not merely hired Hessians, uh, you, know, uh, you know, funneling uh, funds uh, through the center. Uh, but we have been open uh, source. So we have been happy to engage people from uh, Columbia, from Duke, Maryland, uh, uh, you know, across the country to come do these studies. So these studies are available and we try uh, in most cases, to write a kind of an executive summary. So if you don't have the time to, you know, deal with the academic piece, which are long and, uh, you know, uh, have the language of the academic world, uh, you can look at these executive summaries. 
but we've also engaged uh, on more topical issues where the longer gestation period is inappropriate. Uh, we've worked with Brookings on uh, globalization of middle market firms. I'll, I hopefully will say a few words about that soon. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, The Economist, uh, NAM, National Association of Manufacturers, uh, so on and so forth, and where we picked up these topical issues. So we just did a study uh, with the, the Milken Institute about the cost of capital uh, funding issues of middle market firms. And again, we find that middle market firms have their own uh, unique issues, et cetera. So, so that's uh, you know one area, but this kind of uh, research uh, still doesn't give you uh, the immediate status of the middle market. So we do a third kind of research. So academic research, research with uh, institutions like Brookings, uh, and then uh, we do a survey. And this is a survey where we go and talk to 1,000 middle market managers every quarter. And, uh, uh, and I'm about to share with you uh, where the middle market is relative to the other segments in talking to these uh, thousand um, you know, uh, middle market executives. Uh, and what I'll tell you is it tells us about what is happening to revenue, what is happening to employment, uh, to investment, to challenges, and so on and so forth. Uh, about uh, the middle market and and as much as we can about the other segments as well. So, uh, so but the other benefit is, as you can see, that once you have this information on a quarterly basis, not only can you track the middle market over time, uh, you can also begin to ask if you cut the data appropriately by region, by industry, by those three segments I told you about the middle market, about what is happening in your community to which segment of the middle market and which industry. Okay, so that data is also uh, available. Uh, but in, in terms of where is this, so this survey which we started to do once we you know started the center is now entering uh, the fifteenth uh, quarterly survey. So we are beginning to form a nice uh, quarterly series. Incidentally, because before there wasn't much information available, uh, we are very grateful uh, because that's one of our purposes uh, in life as a center uh, to get more attention to the middle market and then to address the challenges of the middle market. Those are the kind of broad issues. Uh, and I can say a few words about how we, have, we are transitioning from growing awareness about the middle market which is what we have been doing so far, to turning to how to enhance the middle market uh, and what, the, what that ag agenda entails. Uh, but uh, from the most recent quarterly survey, uh, which was finished roughly, I think, in June, so the next one is about to be available, uh, this is what we saw. So standing at, this is Q2 2015 uh, survey, and looking back 12 months, going back, uh, the economy had grown in the previous 12 months for the middle market revenue, revenue growth of 7.4%. Very impressive number. However, uh, th this is what the previous uh, you know, number told us. But when we did it here in Q2, now, uh, so maybe I should repeat uh, cl for clarity. If you stand in Q2, look the previous 12 months, that number is 6.6%, and the previous 12 months was 7.4%. But we also asked the question, where do you think your revenue is going forward? That number is 5.1%, okay? So you see, 5.1% is still a pretty impressive rate of growth, but it's not 74 or 6.6%. Okay, so you can see that the middle market continues to perform well, but at a moderated pace. Incidentally, again, standing in Q2, looking at the previous month, relative to the 6.6% of the middle market, the S&P 500 firms actually had a revenue drop by 1.8%, so minus 1.8%. 
So clearly the middle market is, is a kind of, a, at this point in time, an engine of growth in the economy. Let me give you the numbers for employment. Uh, in terms of employment, again, previous 12 months, 4.3%, Q2, Q2, 1.7%, uh, and, uh, sorry, 4.3%, 3.9% Q2 and going forward 2.7%. So same message as the revenue. 2.7%, uh, by the way, is still a pretty impressive uh, rate of growth of employment. Uh, so to give you a sense of contrast, Q2, that is looking back 12 months, the rate of growth for large firms for employment was only 1.7%. These are ADP numbers now. Uh, and similarly, ADP numbers for small firms, the rate of growth was 2.7%. So, so by the way, there's a little message here too. Uh, if you look at these numbers, so in Q2, the, uh, uh, the middle market employment grew by 3.9%, but small firms grew employment by 2.7% not to take anything away from the small firms, but I think the common understanding is that job growth occurs in the small firms. But what we have been finding is that actually the rate of growth of employment in large firms uh, has been uh, frequently and, shall I say, often uh, meaningfully uh, better than that for small firms. Okay. Now, those are the kind of unrecognized facts about the economy and the middle market firm that have very serious policy uh, implications. Um, incidentally, talking about policy, and uh, I described to you the bucket on the uh, research end, but uh, I can say a few words about uh, the outreach bucket. Uh, not only do we take this message out, uh, for, and thank you for the opportunity here today, uh, but we've done that over 100 times uh, since the center started. Uh, and that's how, uh, you know, uh, we, we first met uh, uh, at uh, the Greater uh, Cleveland uh, Partnership, uh, you know, uh, summit. And, uh, uh, and, and so we've been doing it. And we've also uh, joined up with ACG, uh, which is the Association for Corporate Growth, which is uh, dominated by uh, private equity interest. Uh, and uh, uh, we together have uh, formed what is called a middle market caucus, which has about 18 Congress uh, uh, members uh, as you know, equal numbers from both sides of the aisle. Uh, you know, because we want to feed policy also uh, with information about middle market, because I believe small firms and large firms, for various reasons, are part of the consideration uh, and policy determination. We want the middle market to be in that conversation as well. But continuing as to where the middle market is, uh, we also asked the question of these thousand managers, if I gave you an extra dollar, what would you do with it? 67% of them say that they would invest that extra dollar. Now, is the ha glass half full or is it half empty? Because uh, that's also telling us that uh, you know, the remaining 33% uh, are not investing. Uh, you know, they are holding it either as cash or marketable securities. And we also ask them that when you do spend the dollar, what is your intention? Uh, I wish I could tell you a clear uh, area in which they would like to spend it, but it's kind of dispersed in, uh, we'll spend it in HR, we'll spend it in IT, we'll spend it in CapEx, we'll spend it in m and and so forth, and we don't see a kind of a overwhelming uh, uh, one area where I would say, if anything, if I recall correctly, I could stand corrected on this, I think capital expenditure may have been a slight uh, lead in this uh, kind of data. Uh, so, so the question is, uh, what does it tell us about the economy as a whole? Well, what it tells us is that this component of the economy, this significant component of the economy, uh, continues to perform well. and. Uh, but somewhat moderated, and what shall we uh, attribute the moderation to? Uh, 
Uh, I think there are several things that are going on here. Uh, the first of which, of course, is we are long in the uh, recovery process. And for a typical recovery at this point, uh, you generally expect the economy to show some amount of slowing down. Uh, I mean, if you think 2009 is where the official recession ended, you know, we are six years into it. The second part is, as far as it concerns the middle market firms, uh, in terms of their growth opportunities and international opportunity, uh, they do business in Canada, and Canada, as you know, has been slowing down. So has the world been slowing a bit uh, on account of the slowdown in China. So the middle market is not immune from it. But at the same time, I should tell you, the middle market is not as exposed to the vagaries of the international market uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, reason one is uh, that middle markets uh, are far more embedded in their own uh, environment, in their local environment, uh, and uh, so that, of course, uh, you know, shifts it from the international. Also, and this is actually an area where we would like to provide uh, whatever you know we can contribute. Middle market firms need to grow their international business. 60% in our surveys show that 60% of middle market firms have zero international business. And the 40% that do have international business, so conditional on having international business, uh, they are spend the, the only 10% of their revenue. So if you were to look at the whole thing, you would say on an average middle market firm, only 4% of the revenue comes from international. Uh, I think that's really low, uh, particularly if you look at the poster child of the Mittelstand uh, in uh, Germany. And uh, so, so we have, uh, uh, you know, I know, uh, you know, I have to save time for your questions. Um, that uh, uh, clearly there is work to be done in, uh, you know, growing growth in the middle market through globalization. But we also believe, having studied middle market firms, that other areas for growth for middle market firms are uh, better workforce development. That's clearly an area of challenge. Uh, another area of uh, challenge for middle market firms is uh, the uh, area of uh, uh, operational excellence. So these are areas in which we, are, we have done work or we are working. And if you look at our uh, uh, area of innovation, uh, and uh, um, so these are examples of areas in which if you went to our website, you will see uh, studies uh, that we have done to suggest, uh, you know, uh, globalization, which I mentioned, where they're behind as well. So, and there are others. And what we have also discovered is that those middle market firms that have shown high growth, what we call growth champions, have some of these characteristics of these areas that I was telling you about that they do better in the implementation of many of these areas. So, so there is clearly uh, good work to be done uh, to, you know, take this important segment uh, to its rightful recognition in the economy and also uh, to its rightful uh, further contribution to the economy in the future. So I'd be happy to take questions. Today we are enjoying a special Business Leader Series Forum featuring Dr. Anil Makicha, Dean of the Ohio State University Fisher College of Business. We encourage you to organize your questions for our speaker now and remind you that our questions should, your questions should be brief and to the point. If you are using or joining us uh, via webcast and would like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club. We welcome you all here and those joining us via the web stream provided by our primary media partner, 90.3 WCPN, WBIZ PBS, and 104.9 WCLV IdeaStream, or one of our many, many radio stations across the region and country that carry the City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. 
And be sure to join us on Friday, September 18th, as the City Club welcomes William Griswold, the 10th director of the Cleveland Museum of Art, for a conversation on his plans to shape the future of one of America's leading art museums. For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us at cityclub.org. Today, we welcome guests at tables hosted by the sponsors of the Business Leader Series, including Huntington Bank, Redonia, Inside Business, Level 7, and Meaden and more. We thank you for all of your support. We also welcome guests at tables, oh, we can clap. <laughs> we had one. <laughs> We also welcome guests at tables hosted by PNC. We thank you for your support as well. Now it is time to return to Dr. Uh, Makicha uh, for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphone today is City Club uh, content associate, Teddy Eisenberg. Do we have our first question? We have it. Oh. <laughs> Dean McKeesha, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, right now, the most of the the, the world of uh, the those who follow economic news are wondering what the Fed is going to do if they are going to raise interest rates uh, by a quarter percent or not, or choose to do that in another six months. At any rate, at some point, that's going to happen. What will be the impact on the middle market? Uh, that's an excellent question because uh, I think middle market firms are challenged in terms of raising capital. So as I mentioned, we have done a study with uh, the Milken Institute on uh, capital issues of middle market firms. And uh, just a quick observation from that study is that middle market firms try to raise capital through two primary mechanisms. The first of which is, the, I think, the path that they like, uh, which is, uh, and by the way, that path is, tends to be uh, you know, common to other firms as well, and that is uh, internal, you know, or what we might kind of refer to as retained earnings. Um, the second path is uh, uh, banks. And uh, uh, overall, my sense of it is that uh, capital is a greater challenge for middle market firms than it is uh, for uh, particularly large firms. And of course, they don't have the SBA to providing that extra support. So, so this, this might also be an opportunity to make uh, one of those broader statements, uh, you know, uh, which, which obviously will be untrue in many cases, uh, and that is uh, that middle market firms tend to have the resources of smaller type firms, but the challenges of larger type firms. And uh, so they, they have with tremendous capital needs. Uh, presumably, uh, not all of them in this segment are growing into the large firms. In fact, for some of them, maybe being in this middle segment is, in fact, their sweet spot. Uh, so we should not presume that because a firm sits in the middle market very long, uh, that is somehow not the right strategy. Uh, but, uh, but for others, uh, there is growth and growth may require capital. Now, uh, and this I'm really trying to remember the details uh, because I can't uh, recall immediately uh, the timing of the study, but in, in one of the things we found is that when you look at large firms, uh, a, a good proportion of them, uh, and uh, shall I say more than 20%, had been in the middle market firms five years past. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, feeling a little reticent that I mentioned the study because I can't remember the details. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so, but you can see the capital challenge that goes uh, with the uh, middle market firms. So coming back to the, what might be happening with the Fed today, uh, I'm hoping that uh, given uh, the jitters that the economy has gone through, uh, and maybe somebody already has a word as to what they've done, I hope they would skip raising interest rates for now, uh, because I think it'll be good for middle market firms, and uh, arguably even for other firms. Early in your presentation, uh, you mentioned that you subdivided the middle market into three segments. I wonder if you could 
uh, comment on the relative size of those segments yeah. and, and perhaps briefly comment on whether or not you are seeing any emerging differenti differentiations in behavior. Yeah, um, in, in, indeed, uh, uh, we, the, uh, the range for middle market firms of 10 million to 1 billion is obviously very large. Um, but in order to be comprehensive, we thought that it is better to be inclusive and then to segment the data into three segments. And you'll recall that the three segments are going from 10 million revenue to 50 million and then in the middle 50 million to 100 million and from 100 million to a billion okay uh, so what is the distribution of firms the predominant number overwhelming number of firms are in the smallest segment and uh, uh, and, and and that sort of becomes smaller and the smallest segment is um, i believe something like 80 plus percent fall in numbers of firms. But interestingly, when you look at total revenue, uh, that is uh, still there is more revenue coming in the larger ones, but it's not in that 80% kind of proportion. But your question was also about behaviors. Uh, yes, I think their behaviors do differ. So since we were talking about globalization, I can give you a kind of a, a specific example of how their behaviors differ. So if you look at how the small firms globalize, you will find, in, at least in my language, uh, I would say that do, they do so opportunistically, uh, meaning that uh, it is not a well-developed full strategy. It could be that they, you know, their supplier told, me, to, told them there's an opportunity, or a customer said, Hey, hey, you can join along, it's opportunistic. Whereas when you look at the larger firms, they actually enter into alliances, et cetera, which is a much more of a kind of a developed strategy. So overall, you see the small-like kind of behaviors and the large-like kind of behaviors, and it sort of transitions through. Paul? Dean Makija, uh, thanks for speaking with us today and sharing your insights. I was wondering if you could describe any changes occurring or that you would like to see occur in either the curriculum or the career management office of the Fisher College of Business to expose your students and these emerging business leaders uh, to middle market value and opportunities. Sure, sure. And I can uh, assure you that that was not a planted question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll settle up. <laughs> so, so you'll recall that I said we, uh, our activities in the center are in three buckets. Uh, and uh, uh, so the research bucket, we talked a little bit about the outreach bucket as well. Uh, Paul wants to know more about the third bucket, which is the student and curriculum bucket. And here are the kinds of things we are doing in, in that area. Uh, first of all, we are, we, have now, we, we are offering a second time now, uh, and perhaps uh, nowhere else in the country, an actual course on middle market firms. And the structure of that course is that we have an instructor come and talk. Uh, for example, when I was in the course, uh, I came and talked about the finance issues of middle market firms. And then we had the CFO of R.G. Berry, uh, the people who make the deer form slippers, uh, middle market firm in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, he came and talked about the financial challenges of being a CFO of a middle market firm. And like this, we went through the different areas of business. So we've done some curriculum work. We also hold what is called the Fisher Invitational case competition on a middle market firm. What we do is we actually write up the case ahead of the competition, and when students come, we surprise them with it. Uh, but we like to do it on a live case 
So uh, Ethan Allen was the first year, and they are, of course, beyond middle market now. Uh, so we did them. We did Bravo Brio restaurants like that. Uh, you know, uh, so in, in particular, Bravo Brio restaurants, the students were taken to the restaurant. They thought, you know, th and this was a lot of Big Ten, for, you know, uh, schools participate in this, you know. Uh, so uh, they came in, and they thought we were taking them to a nice dinner, except uh, the executives uh, stood up from, um, uh, you know, Bravo Brio and said, it's your case, okay? So we are doing the case competition also. Uh, the third thing which you mentioned in particular was about the job market. Uh, so uh, the first year we actually did a uh, middle market job fair by itself. And now we started doing a middle market integrated job fair with, uh, uh, with other firms as well. So that's become part of our ongoing. And one of the things that I tell students is that, look, uh, you know, not any given particular segment of the economy is right for everybody. But if you want to go to middle market firms, here are the things you get and here are things you don't get. Uh, what are the things you do get? Well, uh, you know, you, you get responsibility sooner. Uh, you get wider diversified responsibility because middle market firms, so to speak, don't have accounts receivable on floor 23 devoted to merely to, you know, uh, you know, so on and so forth. But on the other hand, there is definitely a shine to larger firms. They have more resources and they can give you certain international experience, for example. So clearly, I mean, you know, there are advantages, disadvantages of every segment. You have to look inside of you to ask, what is your fulfilling career in life? I, I hope, Paul, that I was able to. I wanted to ask um, why you think that um, middle market firms are more reticent to enter the international market, and you touched on that a little bit, but then maybe more what resources could be provided or support structures to help um, them embrace globalization. Yeah, so, so part of our study, uh, and I'm seeing if I can pull out the numbers on this, uh, but, uh, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure if I have all the necessary numbers, but I can tell you, uh, let, let me, uh, there are two studies we have done on the globalization of middle market firms. The first study we did with The Economist, and that was back in 2012, and recently, as I mentioned, uh, we did another one with Brookings. And uh, the two studies have some dissimilarities, but in, in the aggregate, uh, it leaves me to this opinion that there are two types of middle market firms. Those, and these tend to be some of the smaller firms, that I think live in more of a, what I would call a cocoon. Uh, why? Because they, the U.S. market is a large market, so they're quite right about that. So there is a lot of growth opportunity, et cetera, and that is what they're fixated on. Uh, in, and they see the international market as a bit of an unknown, and of course the risks of going abroad, you know, all those kinds of things. So there is this group that I would say lives in the cocoon. I say cocoon because the, you know the world is shrinking, and if you don't go out to that international competition there, it's going to come to you. So that's one part of it. But then there are the firms that have gone abroad. And as I mentioned, that these firms, if you look at firms that are growth champions, that have had sustained high rates of growth uh, on an ongoing basis, they tend to have globalization as part of their strategy and activities. So, so clearly, uh, and, they, and what I recall also is, uh, and perhaps this was in the economist study uh, that we did, that firms that go abroad also tell us that one of the benefits of going abroad is that it benefited their domestic operation as well. Okay, so here are the kinds of mindsets. So, do, and those that have gone abroad, again, uh, I believe, were telling us that they intend to grow even more because their experience has been positive. So you got this kind of uh, two-segment uh, response as how the middle market is dealing with the um, globalization issues. Overall, behind. 
because only about 4% on average of the revenue is coming from international. Do you have a sense of the ownership of this middle market group between private equity, public companies, and uh, family or other? Yeah, so I would, uh, uh, I, I would say from 80 to 85% of these firms are privately owned. Um, so, so you might say, you know, 15 plus percent are, uh, are publicly owned and for which you can go to the SEC for data. So it's a overwhelmingly private segment. Um, and uh, at one point I was having conversations with uh, uh, Bloomberg to create an index for middle market firms uh, and we actually worked through some of the, uh, you know, how to develop that index. Uh, and in, in fact, they may even have it on their uh, list of indices. Uh, but, uh, uh, but we kind of didn't stress it that much because it's only such a small segment of the sector. Now, uh, what is the breakdown between private equity and uh, uh, you know, family-owned private firms? I think both are substantial, uh, but the exact number escapes me. Uh, Dr. Makija, where is the voice in Washington for middle market firms and for those of us who have businesses in Cleveland or in Ohio, where, where is the voice in Columbus? I presume your center is a voice, but what, what are the other voices? Yeah, yeah. We, of course, are very happy to hear from you. Uh, and as, as I invite you to our website, where uh, we are very open source. So we like to put out all our studies there. In the, and it's, this was part of the bargain. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, I think this has been a great partnership with GE Capital, although I should tell you that there may well be a transition there because you might have heard that GE Capital is uh, you know, rethinking its uh, position in the middle market. Uh, but uh, uh, so, so beyond the center, uh, there is the middle market caucus. Uh, ACG is, of course, private equity. They have a lot of participants. But overall, uh, I will tell you that a lot of uh, organizations wish there was more for middle markets. And in fact, as I point out, in 2011, not that our definition is ironclad, uh, it was even difficult to have a conversation because people were all over the place. So I'm afraid I can't tell you that there is now this one defined uh, pathway. Uh, there isn't, uh, although we are trying to grow. Uh, let me use this opportunity to mention what our growth plans are. Uh, as I told you, in, in this beginning period, uh, we were fixated on awareness learning about it, and you know, but we also want to turn to what I would call impact. And, uh, and one of the things we discovered uh, over, you know, this has been a learning experience, uh, particularly working with Brookings and others, that firms reside in their metros. Yes, you can think about the national policy, it's important. You can think about state level policy, but the most important environment for middle market firms, we believe, could well be the metros in which they reside. Okay, so that's another area that you might want to pay attention. Uh, so as we turn and look forward, uh, what we are hoping is that we would form relationships with a certain number of metros across the country. Uh, why certain number? So that it's doable. But we've already made a list of those major metros which have a preponderance of middle market firms. So we could take the message, uh, you know, and form partnerships. So for example, I hope that uh, here in Cleveland, uh, we've begun in some level with a greater Cleveland partnership. Uh, perhaps that would grow in this, uh, you know. Uh, so that's another area that I could point you to then. Dean, thank you very much for appearing here today. A question I have is, it, and you were just mentioning about the metros. When you, is your study, your analysis, identified where these 200,000, the middle of the middle, 200,000 companies, uh, where there is a, a greater concentration. And if it has, when you look at some of the um, 
areas of concentration, what is enabling those companies to succeed in those geographies? What are the two or three key elements to their success? Yeah, so I think I can only partially answer your question. Um, yes, we do have a list of the metros now. Just as I shared with you the numbers for Cleveland, we are able to you know look across the country and see where the middle market ones are, and much of it will not surprise you. I'm, I'm not necessarily going in the right order, but these are firms like Chicago, New York, uh, Houston, you know, so on and so forth, LA, uh, you know, where, uh, so, so we've made a list of about 10, 12, where, you know, uh, instead of going everywhere, uh, we could actually form tight relationships so that we can provide that supportive uh, uh, environment uh, for, uh, you know, from our end of it. We know that uh, in working with Brookings, as I pointed out, they, their uh, focus has been on metros, uh, that we have seen that metros play an important role. Uh, as I told you, we are going from awareness to impact, and I can't give you the answers of exactly, uh, you know, what are those, uh, you know, key three things uh, that, at least to my knowledge, although if you go and read some of our stuff, you might be able to glean some of that already. So I'm thinking some of my colleagues may be farther ahead of than me on answering that question. Um, uh, I can tell you this, that uh, uh, if you look at uh, some of the examples I can recall, uh, not all metros have done the same thing. Uh, that also reminds me that uh, to this question of globalization, we also asked firms, were they using the resources that were available to them? Export, import, bank, universities, uh, lo local chamber of commerce, and so forth. And one of my recalls from that table is that many of these resource, resources, ostensibly available, were not actually being exploited. So maybe uh, what we also need to do is not only develop more stuff, but make more effective what we have developed. Thank you for the opportunity. I do have uh, one last question. With all the research that you've done and all the number crutching, what is the likelihood that the Ohio State Buckeyes will be repeat winners of the national championship? After lots of research <laughs> and uh, upturning every stone to find the right data, I think this is the only item that I can give you with no probabilities because it's a sure thing. <laughs> Today at City Club, we have been enjoying a special Business Leader Series Forum featuring Dr. Anil Makicha, Dean of the Ohio State University Fisher College of Business. Thank you, Doctor, again. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.